Sadness and outrage tonight after another school shooting in America. Good afternoon, this is News 2, and we're following a breaking story today of shooting at a high school in Littleton, Colorado. There is word potentially multiple children have been killed. This happened at the Robb Elementary School in the Uvalde Consolidated Independence School District. The 12th Colorado Movie Theater Massacre. Seven bodies were discovered in Oklahoma. Two mosques in Christchurch were targeted, the country's worst mass shooting ever. Hello guys. Welcome to part 3 of my ongoing Halloween series. Please let me know if you are enjoying the daily uploads. Today's case was a very hard one to do. It involves a couple very sad elements, including the unprovoked death of a polite and unsuspecting teenager. Without further ado, let's jump into the case. Yoshihiro Hattori, often referred to as Yoshi, was a Japanese teenager who was visiting the U.S. in 1992 as part of an exchange student program. Yoshi was born in Nagoya, Japan on November 22, 1975, and was 16 years old at the time of this case. Yoshi's parents, Masa and Mieko Hattori, described Yoshi as sociable and friendly. Growing up, Yoshi loved to play rugby on his high school team and enjoyed fishing. He was the middle child between a brother and a sister, his parents stated during a later interview that, quote, At first he was not so active about going to America, but after he passed the test for the American Field Service, he became eager to travel to the United States. The American Field Service, or AFS, is an international youth exchange organization. In his entrance paper submitted to the program, Yoshi wrote, quote, Wherever I go, I wish I could make the country a second home country. I can make Japanese cooking like tempura cutlets for host families and introduce the living way of the Japanese. Yoshi was accepted into the program, and he quickly grew excited to travel outside of his country to the U.S. In August of 1992, Yoshi made his way from his home in Japan to Dallas, Texas, where he was met by his host family, the Haymakers. Together, they made the six-hour drive to their home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he would be living for the year-long trip. Yoshi's host parents were Father Richard Haymaker, a theoretical physicist, and mother Dr. Holly Haymaker, who was a physician. They also had a teenage son, named Webb, who was 16 at the time, the same age as Yoshi. Richard and Holly had hosted exchange students before, but they said that Yoshi was different. He made an immediate impression on them. Holly later recalled, quote, Yoshi was very ebullient, a total extrovert. The kids at McKinley High School loved him because he was such a free spirit. He was a really, really extraordinary guy. He was life. He moved through space like a dancer. Webb Haymaker had nothing but good things to say about Yoshi as well, stating that he had an enormous appetite for life and experience. He also said that Yoshi tried to make friends no matter where they were. Yoshi and Webb quickly grew to be close friends, as they spent a lot of their time together. After he was settled in, Yoshi began to attend McKinley High School as a senior, alongside Webb. That September, Yoshi and Webb went to a blues festival, where they met another Japanese exchange student through mutual friends. Yoshi and this other exchange student became quick friends and exchanged phone numbers. It was a few weeks later, about two months into Yoshi's stay, when he and his host brother Webb received an invitation to a Halloween party. It was being held by the Petres, the host family of the other Japanese exchange student they met earlier at the festival. The party was set for the night of October 17, 1992, and the two boys were excited to attend. Yoshi planned to go to the party dressed in a white tuxedo, imitating John Travolta's character in the movie, Saturday Night Fever. Yoshi was also carrying a camera the night of the party. Webb was dressed as an accident victim, equipped with a neck brace that he had already been wearing after he had gotten a recent injury. To spice the costume up a bit, he wore a bandage around his head, a hand splint, and a bandage around his knee. The party was being held in a neighborhood in the nearby city of central Louisiana, which the two boys headed to at about 8 p.m. on the night of October 17th. Richard allowed the boys to drive the family vehicle, also providing them with directions to get to the Petra home. Webb's parents, Richard and Holly, went out to catch a movie while the two teenagers got ready and headed to the party. As they approached the neighborhood, Yoshi and Webb were looking for a house with the address 10131 East Brookside. Mistakenly, 
they ended up at a house with a very similar address, 10311 East Brookside. This address was extremely similar, with only one of the numbers being switched around. The house was decorated for Halloween. It also had three cars in the driveway, leading the boys to assume further that they had found the party. This innocent mistake would cost Yoshi his life. This home belonged to a 30-year-old supermarket butcher, Rodney Pears, and his wife Bonnie Pears. Not knowing that they were at the wrong address, Yoshi and Webb made their way to the front door and rang the doorbell at approximately 8.15 p.m. There was no answer, but as the boys were waiting, they heard a noise coming from the left of where they were standing. There was a carport there, with an exterior door of the house that was set further back on the building. This noise was that of Bonnie Pears, opening the side door that led to the carport. Still believing this home was the location of the party, the boys peeked around the corner and attempted to get Bonnie's attention. Yoshi tried to speak to Bonnie, calmly walking towards her in the process. Bonnie reportedly panicked when she saw Yoshi moving towards her. She rushed back into the house and slammed the door. She then went to the living room, where her husband was, expressing little about the apparent concerning situation, telling him to quote, get the gun. The sight of his startled wife was frightening to Rodney, and he ran to retrieve his 44 caliber Magnum Smith & Wesson revolver from the closet in their bedroom. Pears, now armed with a loaded revolver, raced back to the carport door, looking out through the blinds. He didn't see anything alarming, and for some reason he didn't seek further explanation from his wife about her startled behavior. Outside, the two boys were obviously perplexed, with Webb later saying, quote, We were walking away sort of confused. I had started to walk down the block wondering if it was a different house. They were both standing on the sidewalk near the car, when Pears flung the carport door open, staying put in the doorway. Upon noticing that Pears was now outside, Yoshi attempted to make contact again. Webb later recalled the following events, quote, Yoshi was very eager to get to the party and didn't understand, I guess, that Pears had a gun. Maybe he thought it was a Halloween thing. Yoshi was light on his feet and just sang, in a very boisterous way, We're here for the party! We're here for the party! Sort of happy, Pears shouted to the approaching Yoshi, Freeze! while he aimed his gun. Webb noticed Pears aiming the gun right away and shouted a warning for Yoshi to stop. Unfortunately, Yoshi spoke very limited English, so he likely did not understand Pears' command, or Webb's warning. He also was not wearing his contact lenses that night, so it's assumed that he either did not see the weapon, or like Webb stated, it's possible that he may have thought it was part of a Halloween prank if he did see the gun. It's important to note that gun violence is extraordinarily rare in Japan, so this may have also contributed to Yoshi not being alarmed by the sight. I don't know if this is true or not, but I had a thought that maybe he wasn't aware or used to the danger of firearms. He may not have been aware that gun laws in Japan are drastically different than in the United States. Take this with a grain of salt, like I said, it was just a thought. Yoshi was reportedly holding his camera at the time, which Pears later claimed he mistook for a weapon. When Yoshi continued to walk towards him, ignoring the command, Pears fired the gun at Yoshi, shooting him directly in the chest from about five feet away. The bullet pierced the upper and lower lobes of Yoshi's left lung, exiting through the area of the seventh rib. Pears then retreated back into the house, slamming the carport door shut and locking it, while telling Bonnie to call 911. Webb ran frantically to the home next door looking for help. He was able to get a neighbor named Stan Lucky to come back to the scene with him. There, they found Yoshi lying on his back, terribly injured. Webb recalls that horrifying moment, quote, He was moaning and crying, but I said, can you speak? And he said, yes. But he was in pain, obviously. Stan seemed to have some sort of knowledge on how to render aid to someone that had been shot, which was very helpful. He immediately elevated Yoshi's feet, and instructed Webb to apply pressure to the wound in Yoshi's chest. 911 was called, but EMTs didn't arrive at the scene until about 8.40 p.m., around 25 minutes after Yoshi was shot. The pairs stayed inside of their house the entire time, until the police arrived. Yoshi was loaded into an ambulance, and was driven away to the hospital. He was still alive when he was put into the ambulance, but sadly Yoshi passed away from blood loss within minutes of starting the drive. Webb was taken to the police station, completely unaware that his close friend and host brother had just passed away. Across town, 
Richard and Holly Haymaker had just exited the theater after watching The Last of the Mohicans. Holly recalled, quote, I said to Dick, as we left the movie, it's great that this country isn't as violent as that anymore. It was after she said this, that her pager started to go off. She called the number that appeared, and the police picked up. The officer on the other end of the call said that something bad had happened. Their son Webb was fine, but Yoshi was not. Holly told the officer that they would meet the police at the hospital, but the officer reportedly replied, quote, that won't be necessary. After learning of where their son was, the haymakers rushed to pick Webb up from the police station, and it was there that they broke the news of Yoshi's death to him. Yoshi's parents were obviously not aware of the tragic incident and had to learn about the news of their own son's death through a worker with the exchange program. Yoshi's mother, Mako, reportedly just retreated to Yoshi's bedroom and cried. At the scene, police initially questioned Rodney Pears, and he was subsequently released, with authorities declining to charge him with any crime. In their view, Pears was within his rights in shooting a trespasser. Two days after the shooting, the Haymakers met with Yoshi's parents, the Hattori's in New Orleans. Holly stated, quote, I was terrified. I was to take care of their son, and he was killed. But the Hitori's immediate concern was for the Haymaker family, Holly said. Quote, the first words Yoshi's mother said were, how is Webb? This case shook the entire world, and it brought a wave of international attention to the culture of gun violence in the United States. The main country impacted by Yoshi's death was Japan, of course. It drew enormous media coverage, where gun violence is a rare occurrence. In the early 1990s, multiple countries were taking a look at and revising their gun laws. A series of violent shootings in Britain and Australia around this time fueled massive changes to their gun control legislation. People all around the world were wondering if America would take a similar approach. Anyway, Rodney Pears was eventually charged with manslaughter after Louisiana Governor Edwin Edwards and the Japanese consul in New Orleans protested against his release. His trial began in May of 1993. Pear's defense worked quickly to establish his actions as self-defense. His team claimed that Yoshi was walking in a, quote, extremely unusual manner. They said that any reasonable person would consider it scary. During his trial, Pears testified about the moments leading up to the shooting. He said, quote, it was a person coming from behind the car, moving real fast. At that point, I pointed the gun and hollered, freeze. The person kept coming towards me, moving very erratically. At the time, I hollered for him to stop. He didn't. He kept moving forward. I remember him laughing. I was scared to death. This person was not going to stop. He was going to do harm to me. After explaining how he shot Yoshi, Pears said, I felt I had no choice. I'm very sorry that any of this ever happened. Pears' defense attorney called the shooting, quote, a one in a million deal where everything went wrong at the same time. Later in the trial, a detective recalled that Pears said to him, quote, boy, I messed up. I made a mistake. Pear's defense team did their best to paint him as an average Joe, saying he was a man just like some of the jury members' neighbors. This was in an attempt to make him more relatable to the jury, in hopes of them letting their guard down about him as a shooter. Doug Moreau, the district attorney, concentrated his efforts on establishing that it was not reasonable for a man of Rodney Pears' stature, a six-foot-two armed man, to be that fearful of Yoshi a 130-pound, polite and friendly, unarmed teenager. They argued that even if he was quickly walking towards him, Pears was still not justified in using deadly force against Yoshi. In response, the defense team claimed that Rodney Pears was, in large part, reacting reasonably to his wife's apparent panic to the situation. Bonnie Pears also testified during the trial, saying about Yoshi, quote, he was coming real fast towards me. I had never had somebody come at me like that before. I was terrified. When describing Yoshi, she said, quote, I guess he appeared oriental. He could have been Mexican or whatever. He was taller than me and his skin was darker colored. After she told her husband about the incident, he reportedly asked no questions. Instead, without hesitation, he went to retrieve his handgun from the bedroom. Like I said before, Pears failed to gather more information about the situation before he opened the carport door to confront whatever threat was out there. Bonnie said, quote, there was no thinking involved. I wish I could have just thought. The trial lasted seven days, with the jury eventually returning a not guilty verdict, 
after deliberating for about three hours. That wasn't the end of the court appearances for Rodney Pears, however. Yoshi's parents, the Hattori's, later filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Pears. During the later civil trial, lawyers representing Yoshi's parents argued that both Bonnie and Rodney Pears acted unreasonably the night of Yoshi's tragic death. They said that Bonnie overreacted to the presence of two polite and harmless teenagers outside of the house. They went on to claim that both Bonnie and Rodney behaved unreasonably, they did not communicate properly, and Bonnie failed to convey what exactly the perceived threat was. The Hattori's lawyer stated that if the couple were truly terrified, they should have stayed in the home and called the cops. But by leaving the protection of the home, Rodney Pears failed to take the best path of safety. Furthermore, they claimed that Pears resorted to deadly force far too quickly. Without assessing the situation properly, he shot Yoshi with intent to kill. The lawyer suggested that a better plan of action would have been to fire a warning shot or aim to shoot Yoshi in a non-vital area in hopes to simply injure him rather than in the torso. It was also brought up again that the much larger Rodney Pears would have been able to easily subdue the smaller and shorter Yoshi Hattori. Overall, they argued that a far greater show of force was used than what would have been appropriate. The courts found Pears liable, ordering him to pay just over $650,000 in damages to Yoshi's parents. In today's money, that would be equal to about $1,350,000. The pairs appealed the verdict, but the Louisiana Court of Appeals upheld the judgment in October of 1995. They again attempted to appeal the decision, this time to the Supreme Court of Louisiana. But in January of 1996, this second appeal was also rejected. Rodney Pears' insurance covered $100,000 of the settlement, but Pears was left responsible to pay the remaining $550,000. Yoshi's parents, the Hattori's, used this money to set up two charitable funds in Yoshi's name. One to fund U.S. high school students wishing to visit Japan, which, as far as I can find, is still up and running over 30 years after Yoshi was killed. And the other one was to fund organizations that lobby for gun control. Over in Japan, the public was shocked and angered by Yoshi's death, and more so about Pears' acquittal in the case. Over 1.7 million Japanese citizens signed a petition urging stronger gun control. They were joined by over 120,000 American citizens who also signed a similar petition. Both of these petitions were presented to U.S. President Bill Clinton and Congress. You've got to remember that this was a time before emails, cell phones, or social media. All campaigning in connection with these petitions was done by word of mouth, or snail mail. The fact that they still managed to get the huge number of signatures that they did is impressive. Yoshi's parents, along with his host family, the Haymakers, became active campaigners for gun law reform in the U.S. They met with President Clinton about the issue in November of 1993. Both the Hattori's and the Haymakers were active supporters of the Brady Bill, which was originally introduced into the U.S. House of Representatives in 1991. This bill mandated a background check and a five-day waiting period for the purchase of firearms in the United States. On November 30, 1993, it was signed into law by President Clinton, officially called the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. Throughout the years, the Hattori's along with the Haymakers continued to be present in gun control activism. Following the Parkland High School shooting in March of 2018, where 17 people were killed and 17 more were injured, Yoshi's parents and his host family participated in the March for Our Lives. Following Yoshi's death, some claimed that the incident was racially motivated, noting that Bonnie Pears first said she noticed that Yoshi was darker colored than her. Some argued that had Yoshi been white, Bonnie and Rodney Pears may not have overreacted in the way that they did. The Haymakers did an interview following Yoshi's death, stating that they also believed that Yoshi would not have been shot if he was white. Some people living in Baton Rouge stated that Bonnie possibly thought Yoshi was a light-skinned black man, Bonnie, of course, rejected these theories that her actions were racially motivated. She stated, quote, It was his fast movement toward the door that scared me so bad, not the color of his skin. The Haymakers, along with the Hattori's for years, continued to support their stance on gun control. Last year, on the 30th anniversary of Yoshi's death, his parents finally retired from their role. With them now being in their 70s, 
they said that it is now up to the younger generation of people to keep pushing for the necessary changes regarding gun laws in the United States. The Haymakers and the Hattori's were very influential in the passing of the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. Without them, the passing of this bill may have been severely delayed. All members of both families played an important role. Webb Haymaker, Yoshi's host brother, went on to become a psychotherapist, working mainly with children and adolescents. He had a gift of relating and supporting children and teenagers that were in the middle of a crisis. He spent part of his career at a mental health agency in New Orleans, before he moved on to work at a drug diversion program for juveniles in New Haven, Connecticut. Webb eventually moved back to New Orleans, where he then turned his attention to helping adults with their mental health issues. During this time, he continually focused on perfecting his craft. He was a devoted and respected board member of the New Orleans Birmingham Psychoanalytic Center. He also spent time educating other mental health professionals, striving to improve the system as a whole. Though he held a very successful career helping others in need, Webb himself struggled heavily with his own mental health. It comes with a heavy heart when I say that Webb unfortunately committed suicide last year, on March 1, 2022, at the age of 46. At the time of his death, he had a daughter and was excitedly awaiting a new baby. Webb was an amazing, caring, and devoted man. He is remembered for his quirky sense of humor, unconditional love, and his overwhelming passion for helping others. Yoshi Hitori too was a very special young man. From all that I've read, he seemed like an outgoing, friendly, lovely kid that was excited for his future. I'm heartbroken that he will never have the opportunity to become the person he was meant to be. Please, take a few moments to remember the life of our main victim, Yoshihiro Hattori. But also, I think Webb Haymaker deserves a few moments, for all of the good he went on to do. I'd like to know what you guys think about this case. Do you think the pairs acted irrationally? Do you think they were justified? I'm curious to see your guys' opinions. As always, keep your comments respectful no matter what you think. You never know who might read them. Thank you guys for watching through to the end of this video. I truly hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back tomorrow for the next case in the Halloween series. Please take a minute to follow my social media listed in the description. I'd love to connect with you all further. I hope you have a great day, and remember to stay safe.